Good morning. Still morning? No. Good afternoon. Going to be fast because I haven't had breakfast, so I'm hungry. That will help. Will help uh, moving us forward. Um, we're going to talk again. Remember, we're going backwards. We start with all the good stuff, and we're going backwards all the way to the foundational stuff. And uh, if, uh, in Danny's eyes, um, data characterization and uh, drug utilization is mediocre, this will be boring. Okay. <laughs> We're going to talk about um, the common data model, and then we're going to talk about how you get to the common data model. Um, and Erica and Moe are going to talk about that a little bit. Um, so here's how this whole thing works. Okay. Um, and actually, I was wondering whether I should show these slides because they feel like they're a little um, worn out by now already. But apparently now, you know, they have made it into, uh, you know, they're like moving from uh, um, presentation to presentation. So maybe it wasn't such a bad idea. Um, so how do you traditionally do this? Generating insights or evidence from existing data. Okay, so you have a question. Okay treatment pathway in blood pressure. Um, it's like an appliance, and you plug it into the data, and everybody has their own data, and they all look different, which is crazy because they are essentially all the same. Patients, us, everybody's a patient, so from that perspective, the word patient is always funny, um, have a problem, go to the doctor, it gets diagnosed, it gets treated. It's always the same. Except the data always look completely different. Okay? So if you want to do something, you have data. That's already a good thing. And what do you do? You wire it up. Okay? You build a SAS script or an R script in order to answer the question that you have, treatment pathways. How are people with blood pressure being treated? <laughs> and after a while, um, you have a lot of those. And only you have them, and nobody else knows what's going on. And some people do SAS uh, macro libraries and all that kind of stuff. Um, really doesn't work. Um, you need a lot of people which are expensive and hard to get. It's very slow. It's not transparent. Um, you can't pass it on from one to the next. It's expensive. And people who are not techies cannot do it. That is a problem. Lots of peop more people are not techies, particularly the ones who actually have the research questions, then who are? What we want to do is, and this is what facilitates the whole approach in our community, what we want to do is we want the data to look the same so that we can plug our appliance in and it will work, just like when you go and buy okay, a flattening iron. Okay? And if you do this, you have actually the opportunity to make these um, appliances really well, and you can focus on them, and you can have different ones. You can have, you know, patient level estimation, uh, population level estimation, and patient level prediction, and all sorts of characterizations, and data quality, and mortality, and safety, and everything else that we are talking about was shown to you um, pre, um, in the prior talks. Okay, um, in Electric appliances, you wouldn't even think that it could be any other way, and you yourself have to build your appliance and somehow hook it up to the electric grid. Nobody in their right mind even would have such an idea. Okay? You expect the Tesla to work in the same plug as the toaster. Okay? And it does. And here, this is a, uh, this is a new idea, it's a revolution. Right? So that's what we're trying to do, and that will facilitate everything that we're doing, because there are very few organizations or institutions who have everything together. Databases, statisticians, programmers, clinical researchers, administration, and, and um, informaticians, IT people who can actually run this kind of thing in one place. It doesn't happen very often. So what we have to do is we have to divide the labor, come together, and do these things together. Okay. We call this Odyssey Tools, and we call this OMOP CDM, and George already explained why it's still OMOP, which really means that people more or less use the words OMOP and Odyssey now synonymously, 
even though it was a very different project. This means you don't have to have the data that you are studying. You can write a legend program with 1.6 billion little mini uh, epi studies and distribute it to your friends and they're going to run it for you. Okay? Because it will fit. The data can be hidden behind a firewall. They don't even have to be de-anonymized because if they're behind the firewall, people who, who own data, they, they have the fully identified information, they have the phone numbers, they can actually call these people and yet they can run studies. Okay? So you can have all these people to be part, participate in, in, in the whole approach. And then we can have a network. And this is what we are sitting here for. And we can have networks of networks, right? So this is, could be Eden. This could be another network. Could be individual institutions who don't want to be in a network because they want to do what they want to do. It actually doesn't matter. Um, you know, where you are and what you are and uh, how you're organized, the overarching idea is this is a community who can do these things together very efficiently. And you don't even have to have data. You can participate just as a subject matter expert or as a programmer or a statistician and be useful and be on the paper. And I mind you, there is nothing in the middle who is the big boss of everything. Okay? Anybody can initiate, and that's what we want to achieve, actually. Anybody can initiate research and ask questions. And anybody else who wants to participate can participate. There's no obligation. But I, I, in my uh, experience, um, the, um, the questions that people ask are actually good enough for always, almost always um, network participants to agree and to participate. Very rarely that people say, oh, that's a stupid question, I'm not going to do that. Usually, they say, sure. And plus, they don't have to do anything. You give them the code, they already have the data ready, all they have to do, switch the machine on, dump a piece of code, run it, and email the results back. Okay? That's pretty easy. And you own a paper, if there's a paper. paper. Writing paper is a little slow in the community. So how do you do this? How do you get there? Um, you have to create these outlets, these sockets. And they, the way that works is they have to standardize the data, and it's fairly strict. There is not a lot of uh, variability, and we actually, we're actually going to make it stricter and stricter and stricter and stricter. And when you see me on the forum, you're going to think you know, I'm a, like a dictator or a stickler. It is the necessity, otherwise, you can't ask a question, give me all the patients with hypertension and ACE inhibitors. Okay? Because everybody has a different opinion of how that, or it's differently represented, and you have to start from scratch and interpret the question. Don't interpret the question. The question is owned by the people who want to ask the question. Okay? Not a whole lot of people who do second thoughts. So the data have to be standardized, and the research, which is what um, Martin and Jenna and, and, and so on just showed you. Okay? So I'm not going to talk about the research. I'm talking about the data. The data have to be st standardized in their structure, so the tables and fields. The content, what constitutes hypertension. I want patients with hypertension, so the word hypertension has to be clean. Okay? And the semantics, what does it actually mean? Hypertension. Okay. Um, we call this the OMOP CDM and the OMOP standardized vocabularies. Okay. They belong together, um, even though some people just download the vocabularies and use it for other purposes. Well, it is fine. Um, if we're, what we are doing here, these come together, and you do not have the luxury to define your own reference table. Everybody uses the same OMOP standardized vocabulary as a reference table. It's not yours. Okay? It's ours. It's ours. So the OMOP CDM, you know, lots of people who are in the room, of course, know this very well. Others are new. Um, it is a model which supports more than one thing. Yes, there's a lot of safety. There's a lot of drug outcome. There's a lot of outcome to interventions. But there's more use case than that that you can do. Okay. Um, we have drug safety. 
we have device safety, um, vaccine safety, comparative effectiveness, health economics, quality of care. All of these heat is, I don't know, Europe they're called differently. Clinical research, okay, um, that can be uh, driven by the same model. So this is not just, even though a lot of what we're doing is about drugs, because there are lots of people in the room who, whose job it is to do that, um, there are a whole lot of other use cases which will be supported by this. And the way you do this is you place these, the, in, the information about the patients in these standardized um, ta tables and fields, and they're not that hard. And there is a, um, a description which is fairly good about you know, what exactly should go in there and what should not go in there, which is equally important. This is the standard reference table that every OMOP um, implementation has to use. You can download it for free okay, from athena.odyssey.org. Um, and you know, a lot of, we, we like to um, steal. So whatever is in the reference table is what people use in the public. Okay. Um, and of course, not everything's in there. So we have to keep working, work, working on it. Um, but the idea is that it is Odyssey's semantics, Odyssey's concepts or codes, and Odyssey's type of organization. If you don't like it, you can complain or start discussions in the forum or in the other, in the other uh, ways, and you will have somebody who's going to answer and engage with you. Okay? This is very close to us. It's us. It's our stuff. Vocabularies, what are they trying to do? Vocabularies are organized by domains. Every concept knows what it is. If you're a, if you're a drug, you're, in, you're a drug. If you're a condition, you're in a condition. If there's a procedure in a procedure table called vaccination with flu vaccine, that is a drug. It's not a procedure. Yeah, it's a procedure because to jam the syringe into the arm. But that is actually the, not the important piece. The important piece is the vaccine that goes into the arm. Okay? So even though it's in a procedure table in your, in your original data, it's a drug. The OMOP standardized vocabulary define what is what and where it goes. You don't define that. Okay? I sound very uh, strict right now, but I, and I want to, because it's very important, because otherwise the system is going to break down, and you can't plug the plugs in anymore. They're not going to fit. No duplicates. We're trying to have one representation for a thing, one hypertension, one myocardial infarction, one captopril, whatever we have. We want to cover it all, so we're not missing anything. We want to have a hierarchy, and we want the ones which are not the standard ones, the deduplicated ones, to be mapped to the duplicated ones, so you don't have to do this. Okay? You have ICD-10, and now you have to figure out you know, how you map it over to uh, SNOMED. Don't do that. You get, get that, too, for free. Okay? There's a hierarchy. And so, yeah, so general way it works is there are the source codes which are in your data. Okay? All sorts of, it's, it's, this list is not uh, uh, comprehensive. They get mapped into the standard ones, which are representing the data. Everybody uses, for conditions, SNOMED-based concepts for conditions. Okay? You don't have a choice. You can, you can argue and start discussing it. That's fine. But as, until somebody makes a change or the community accepts a change, this is what it is. And you can have classification systems. Same is true for drugs. Okay. Here are the codes in your, um, in your databases. And you know, as Europe is coming on to the Odyssey system, there are going to be many, 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 many more. And they are harmonized into RxNorm, RxNorm extension, and their drug classes. Why do we need a hierarchy? Because these things are not a one man, one vote system where things are in parallel independent entities. Okay, so vector of disease, okay, is an ankylosing spondylitis, and it is a spondylarthropathy, and there are other spondylarthropathies. Okay, so 
if you have this, you also, uh, if you have this, then you have also this, and you have also this at the same time. There is a hierarchy in our systems should take into account this hierarchy because that's how medicine works and how the, how the doctors actually think and how they work. They start from generic and then it's called diagnostic work up going to the specific. Okay. Drug hierarchy, same thing. An ingredient is not a drug, it's just an ingredient. Okay. And the more you add, the more the information you have, and your data may have different level of information. If it's just an order, you may have less. If you have a full um, uh, product, then you have more information. Um, with the Europeans, the, the drug markets work differently in the US, so we added um, pre-specified um, package sizes and manufacturers because it's part of the drug coding system in many European markets. And this is good because you can use these hierarchies like a magnet to pull out what it's important for you to pull out. So you take the concept which has, represents the attributes you want, inhalant budesonide, which is a corticosteroid. Okay? All the children are inhalant budesonides in you know, the powder or liquid that goes, or like a puff, whatever it is. They all fit in. You don't have to worry about this. Okay? So for defin defining cohorts and distributing it through the community, this is an extremely useful and enabling uh, mechanism, and people have to um, you know, ap um, um, adopt it. Show you a little bit of the European drug market, because of course every country has a different one. This is um, Nicorette, if you're trying to quit smoking. Um, you see, um, the, oh, many um, markets have them as chewing gums or lozenges, which are little, like little, little dro uh, drops. Okay, and others have them as a cartridge, as an inhaler. You can actually puff this stuff, like a, almost like a cigarette itself. Um, a solution, um, you know, nasal spray, a sublingual tablet. So this is our problem. Okay. We need to be able to, it's again, comprehensive. We have to have them all. And they have to be in a consistent hierarchy so we can use the magnet and pull all the nicorettes out, patients who take a nicorette. So we, uh, con we, are, we de deviated from the rule of not creating vocabularies, only stealing them, and created a vocabulary, which is an extension of Rx norm, and it's called Rx norm extension. And most of what you are going to have in your data is Rx norm extension. Exact, um, in fact, about half or little or two thirds of your drugs are not sold in the United States, which is Rx norm. And the overlap is, well, as you can see here, it's like two thirds, one third, two thirds to one third. Drug markets different in every country. Is it? Is it it's crazy. Obviously, at the ingredient level, the overlap is much, much, much more. Everybody has nicorette, okay, um, or nicotine, really. Um, but the actual products um, in their detailed description will differ. And we have to have a system where this all comes together. Otherwise, we, we can't do it. We can't do a, a European network or a worldwide network. Okay. Okay, this is a duplication of the slides. I think I'm going to have time. I'm done. Um, so how do you do this, right? So you're now looking at this and saying, oh my God, there's all this stuff which I have to do and I have to have an Rx norm extension. Where the hell do I get an Rx norm extension? There are two ways to do it. You go to the forum or you go to the if GitHub issue list and there's two, one for the data model and one for the vocabularies. And if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter. We're going to pull it in the right one, okay? and you put your thing in, and somebody is going to respond. That's it. This is, there's no bureaucracy here. There are no committees. You don't have to sit through anything or write um, applications or forms. Okay? This is it. It's us. It's our community. And if you need something, you get it done. These are the people who actually are behind the scenes. Okay? There are a whole lot of people who work on the vocabularies. Some of them are in the room. Okay? make friends with them, they are going to be 
good friends, okay, because they will be able to very quickly and un, in, um, uh, uh, unbureaucratically help you. And Claire runs the CDM working group. If we want to make an improvement or fix something, then Claire will actually make that happen and put it in the system, and we can iterate this uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Thank you. Okay, so Christian talked a lot about standardization. So we standardize the format of our data sets into the common data model, and we standardize our terminologies using the OMOP vocabulary. But unfortunately, our data doesn't magically just get into the CDM, and we have to do some work to get it there. And so since in Odyssey we've probably done this a couple hundred times, we've come up with an, a preferred process for moving forward and getting your data into the CDM and we have tools to support that activity. So over the years we've learned that the best way to kind of get your data into the CDM is to first, before you start programming anything, get in a room and design what you want to do. And usually that involves a lot of different people. So you should probably have somebody who knows about the data set, who's an expert in the data, and you should probably have somebody who knows a little bit about the CDM. And those individuals can think about how do we want to get from our raw data into the CDM format. Once you've come up with a design document, you're also going to have to go through an exercise to translate your source codes into standardized terminologies. Now, Christian talked a lot about what's already in the vocabulary, and a lot of times the vocabulary can do the work for you. But I think in Eden, we're going to have a lot of cases where the source vocabularies are not already in the OMOP vocabulary. And so you'll need to get people with medical knowledge to help you do some of the mappings. But we have some tools to support that process as well. After you've done your design and you know how you want to do your mappings to the uh, vocabulary, you essentially have everything you need to do to get started and actually start programming. So you have an ETL document. Then we have a recommendation of, there's lots of people who can probably do an ETL, but it's good to have people who have some experience with um, extract, transform, and load processing. Um, basically, you want to end up with a process that is repeatable and that doesn't involve a lot of human intervention. And you also want to end up with a process that's quick. You don't want to be waiting three weeks for your data to convert into the common data model. And people who have experience in this can help ensure that your process is doing that appropriately. Once you have something that can take your raw data and build a common data model, um, you then start to get into this process of iteration. So once you build your data, you're going to notice problems. You might find a bug, or you might want to make an improvement. So you go back around the circle, you'll update your document, your programmers will update the process, and you'll just continuously go around. You're never going to be done. You're always going to have ways to improve it. The CDM will change, the vocabulary will change, your raw data will change. So you'll constantly be in this cycle. Now, because we recognize this is an important part of the process and not an easy part of the process to get your data into the common data model, we've developed tools to help facilitate this process. So one of those tools is White Rabbit, and you can take White Rabbit and actually scan your raw data. And White Rabbit will learn about what's going on, what tables are there, and what kind of information is in those tables. Once you perform a scan, you can load that scan into Rabbit in the Hat. And now Rabbit in the Hat knows something about your raw data set and actually de um, develops a graphical interface to help you do a mapping exercise. Now, it's not writing any code, but it's helping you go through the exercise of designing what you want to do in order to get into the common data model. So this is an example of a white rabbit scan. And like I said, um, white rabbit is going to go and essentially for each table, it's going to say, OK, what kind of columns do I see in each table? And then within each individual column, what are the distinct values that I'm seeing? So this is a scan of a synthetic data set. And this is a uh, patient table. So this table in this synthetic data set is going to have information about individual patients. So in this scan, it found that there's a column called marital. You'll see it's in column W up there. And what it discovered was that 
um, there, the most frequent value in this marital column was M. So that probably stands for married. The second most frequent column in uh, uh, data in this column was nothing. And the last most common um, uh, data item in this column was S, probably for single. So now this very simple scan has taught me a lot about what's going on in my data. And as I move across uh, the spreadsheet, I'm learning about all the other columns in this one table. So the patient's table has a race column. The most common race in my data set is white. The patient's table has an ethnicity column. Uh, the most um, common value is Irish. Then we get to gender. So uh, a lot of times you might assume a lot of our data sets have either male or female's representation. And um, if you're going and designing a document and you're only thinking about those two options, you um, might not design your code appropriately to handle for scenarios where male and female are not the only options. And so the scan taught me that in this data set, there is one person with an unknown gender. And so when I'm writing my ETL, I'm going to need to think about how do I want to handle that. So once we have the scan and we learn something about our data, we can actually load that into Rabbit in the Hat. And Rabbit in the Hat provides a graphical interface for us to think about how we want to do our mapping. And it is as simple as starting to draw arrows. So at this layer, what I've been doing, what we're doing here is taking the source tables, which are seen in orange, and physically drawing lines to where we think the tables are going to map into the common data model. So going back to our patients, you can see it sort of on the orange in the bottom there. Um, I've decided that the patient table, patient's table holds information that I'm going to use in the person table in the CDM. So I've drawn that arrow. But mapping your tables is not good enough. You have to actually map the columns as well. So if I drill into that patient to person link, I can start to think about, well, what columns do I need to map up into the CDM? So if I go along with that gender idea that we had before, I know that I'm going to want to map my gender field in patient's table to the gender concept ID in the CDM. And because in my scan report, I learned a little bit about the values that I'm going to see, I can also write out some of the logic that I want to implement. So um, because we're trying to standardize um, our data, I'm going to want to convert my M and F to concept IDs. So I've written out logic here. So M, for example, is concept ID 8507. But then I also want to tell the developer what to do when you see unknown. So in this case, for this database, it makes sense to drop that patient. So out of all our patients, we're going to drop one person because we don't know if they're male or female. So that's talking about designing your documentation. And um, then you, you move in the process, you move forward to thinking about how do you actually standardize your terminologies. Um, now, we're not going to talk today about how you use the OMA vocabulary to do that. But what we're going to talk about is a tool called Usagi, which helps you in the scenarios where you have source codes that do not exist in the vocabulary, but you need to map them to standardized terminology. So Usagi will take your source codes and their descriptions and try to make recommendations to you of what concepts it believes that it's most closely related to. And it provides this interface for you to actually go through and see, do you agree with how the tool try to um, make some assumptions about what to map to? So this facilitates that process. Um, the tools also facilitate in testing. So once you've developed all your documentation, you hand it over to the developer, you can actually use Rabbit and the Hat to start to develop test cases to test your logic. So for example, if in your logic you said, okay, if I see a person who was born in the year 2099, maybe I don't feel that that data is very accurate, and that's another person I might want to drop. And so you can use this uh, R framework to facilitate developing test cases. So when your developer is done, you can actually see if they've built what you've asked them to build. So we talk about testing, but um, once you have your data, it's also good to start to visualize how the data is represented once you actually convert it into the, the common data model. And so we have some post-processing tools that will actually characterize what's going on in the data. So there's a tool called Achilles where you can look at at a very high level what's going on. 
And one of my favorite tools um, to look at, or uh, um, graphs to look at in Achilles is a data density plot after I've built a CDM. And what the data density plot is sh uh, showing me is how much data do I have in each table month over month? And then generally your data will grow over time. But if you ever noticed an odd pattern, that might signal something you want to investigate. So this is actually a real scenario that we had um, at my organization where one of our data sets, um, we noticed a really weird spike in October of 2015 in our data set. So this is condition occurrence. Everything's going along fine, and then all of a sudden it spikes up. Now in the US, in October 2015, we converted from ICD-9 to ICD-10. And in the OMOP vocabulary, there are different versions of the ICD-10 vocabulary. So um, in the US, we use ICD-10-CM, and then there's the generic um, ICD-10 um, vocabulary. And we had a bug in our program that was uh, mapping um, to both of those vocabularies. And so essentially, we were just duplicating everything. But a simple graph like this exposed that very easily. You can see that there was an issue there. Now, I've gone through this very quickly. Um, today, uh, during the Collaborator Showcase, uh, Claire is going to be talking a little bit more about Rabbit in the Hat and Usagi. So if you want to learn a little bit more about those tools, you can, get, um, uh, you can look at that today. We've also developed an ETL tutorial, so I'm sure we're going to see some of you at that tutorial on Sunday. Um, but if you, uh, if you are interested, we'll be recording that tutorial as well. So I've talked a lot about how to get into the CDM, and now Mui's going to talk a little bit about how do we remain consistent once we're in the CDM. Hi. Um, there's always a lot of pressure being the last person right before lunch because everybody thinks everything that we've talked about is extremely interesting, but your tummy is telling you I'm hungry. So I'm going to go as fast as I can and make this as sweet and clear as possible so we can all break for lunch. Okay. So what is Themis and what is our purpose? Uh, it's a working group that actually was formed a little while ago um, at the symposium 2017. So really, what are we trying to accomplish? So our purpose is really to develop rules and regulations to combat the inconsistency inconsistent representation of the same data source across observation, across Odyssey, okay? And its inability to gather reliable and scalable evidence because everybody understands the common data model, except when we actually go and try to ETL it in, everybody has its little knickknacks and everybody thinks, well, I really, really want to get this in because it's unique to us. We want to get away from that. We want everyone to be following the same common rules as well when you're converting. So it's not just about the models, you know, common and standard, but the rules that you're using are also common and standard. So what we've, got, um, we've come up with as a vision for the uh, Themis Working Group is a roadmap of how can we accomplish something that will actually go and certify every Odyssey OMOP CDM conversion, okay? We started this roadmap, like I said, in 2017 at the symposium when we kicked off the first Themis working group to figure out what all the problems were that everybody had out there that says this is what I think is inconsistent about what we do in our OMOP CDM, okay? Or these are the issues I've run into, how do I deal with this? Uh, what we did in Q1 um, of 2018 was to actually develop the first set of conventions and documentation. And we released that at the symposium in 2018. And we're now working on release two and a certification. So in March, just to give you a little information about that, in March 2018, we actually worked on almost 80 issues. Um, we ratified 46 of them and put them back out to the community to get everybody's opinion on it. Uh, some of them are examples of duplicitous drugs on the same day. What do you do with that? What if you? What about you know pharmaceutical visits? Are they really considered visits in your data model? Should they be or should they not be? Right. So from there, we kept working and working, 
And like I said, at the symposium of 2018, we released the first version, which had over uh, 19 different issues that we actually closed. If you want to see all of them, you can go to GitHub, uh, look up Themis, and you'll find us. We are trying to aim for a second release in 2019, uh, May. It's a little aggressive. We might push that out to June, but um, that's what we're re hoping for. But it takes more than just um, getting people to tell us what their issue is. What it also takes is some kind of systematic way of verifying that these conventions were actually followed. So our idea is to do a certification, right? Very similar to many other organizations. We want a certification on your OMOP model. Well, in order to make that happen, that requires people coding it. So, if you would like to join the Odyssey community and you don't, haven't figured out a way to join it yet, come to our hackathon. It's in May of 2019 on the 14th and the 15th, and it's in the beautiful, beautiful campus of the University of Colorado in Denver. Great skiing time, although I'm not too sure it's skiing time during that time, but they have great, great other stuff that you can check out. Um, what we're trying to do there is basically we're going to figure out what the gaps are between all of our rules and Achilles, um, as well as figuring out what type of program to build. And then we're just going to actually sit down and build. We do a lot of these in the Odyssey community where we get people together and just start building. That's how we collaborate, and it's, and it's fun, and it's uh, quite a great experience if you've never been to one. So I uh, really, really hope uh, some of you, I'll see some of you guys in May in the United States in Denver. So um, everything that Christian, you know, Eric and I talked about, it was very brief. We covered it very briefly. We can actually talk for days and days on this stuff. And if you really want to get to know us more or to better understand what we do, come join us tomorrow um, at the OMOP Vocabulary and CDM tutorial or Saturday at the OMOP CDM ETL tutorial. Like Patrick says, uh, Christian does bite. Um, but Erica and I do not. We are very, very fun to chat with, so please do come join us at um, our tutorials. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. You can ask Patrick why he says you bite, okay? Um, but since he said it. So please come join us. Um, even if you're not in the class, feel free to stop us in the hallway and chat with us. We love questions. We love answering anything you have. So with that, thank you very much.